Oh, good evening. Hello, everybody. It's the Boo Gooders again. It's me, Colin, and my pal Jeff here, as usual, talking uh, comics and beer. Um, and we are joined with another fantastic guest this week again. Um, and with us today is Craig Payton, Glasgow based illustrator, who is currently on Kickstarter with an amazing looking art book called Hard Code, which we're going to be quizzing them about um, just now. Jeff, do you want to start off with a round of hard fire, hard code questions even? Um, um, for, for yes, uh, <laughs> I, I will. I, I, thanks for putting me on the spot there, Colin. Like when I was trying to share the, 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 the link to everywhere. Um, yeah, um, thanks for joining us, Craig. Uh, can you tell us, so um, will we start with hard code since it's, it's your most, uh, it's your most, it's your current project. Um, can you tell us what, so Carl mentions it as an art book. Do you want to tell us a wee bit more about what the project is? Um, well, before, uh, before I kind of get into doing comic art, I was uh, primarily a professional illustrator. So uh, hard code's kind of like a kind of combination of those two fields. Like I've had to kind of combine illustration with, uh, with comics and made this kind of illustrated book with like um, occasional short comic stories, one pages, and you know, uh, short kind of comic excerpts and stuff, along with a few kind of like visual narrative stories, which is just a story made up of various illustrations. So it's a little experimental, but it feels like the kind of um, uh, the kind of medium that's kind of right for me that to, to, to do my best work. So, see how it goes, I guess. How, um, what's the what's the feedback been like so far? You're on Kickstarter right now. Oh uh, yeah, so. yeah, I watched the Kickstarter on uh, Saturday there, and uh, uh, maybe it made a goal in like six hours. So that was that's incredible. Um, it's been a much uh, more positive response than I expected, but and I'm naturally pretty pessimistic. So <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the response has been been crazy. It's uh, about two hundred percent now. Normally, like day six. Yeah, but you have been teasing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple of months you've been kind of, kind of releasing little teaser right. pictures and stuff, and it's, I yeah, guess, probably built up, up, up a bit of a following. Mm. Yeah, I mean, kind of building up, for, uh, working on the spamming social media for like the past <laughs> six months or so, building it up as I go. Do you um, think that's worked? I, I, you're, that's him. I mean, that, you're looking at the numbers there, that's the. Uh, that's the that's the um, that's the dream for people at Kickstarter. You get people that would been dream it like hitting that kind of response so quickly. I mean, to be uh, got a lot of us uh, your your pre marketing, just um, heavily promoting it before you begin. It seems like if you're uh, if you start promoting once the campaign starts, it's it's too late. You need to, uh, it takes a long time to kind of get word to spread mm -hmm. through social media, especially among people that you don't know. If you try to uh, try to attract new people, and not just your circle of friends, yeah. um, I, think, I think that's what's happening here. Hopefully, uh, with the stuff we did with uh, Dave on Cotopia, it's kind of like a learning experience because his background is um, he's a marketing professional, so I learned yeah. a lot of uh, sneaky black magic tricks for, uh, for marketing. <laughs> Um, I was, it was. I found it really interesting. We had Dave on. Um, we had Dave on right at the start of lockdown, um, yeah. and we've had a few, we've had a few people on who have, um, like yourself, had successful Kickstarters, um, and we've had so many people have gone. That's become like where the conversation has gone because um, I think, particularly with asp aspiring comic writers and comic artists, um, Kickstarter is probably the most obvious and attainable way to, to reach mm. your goals. Yeah. It's quite it's quite interesting to hearing people different people's um tricks and tactics and like you say, I like they call them like the black market kind of techniques. Uh, the tricks. It kind of seems like uh Kickstarter's becoming like the biggest publisher publisher of comics at the moment. Like the rival in Marvel and DC. Uh, yeah. definitely um uh there's no kind of like lowering of quality yeah, compared to Marvel and, and DC. Some of the um, indie comics that come out of Kickstarter are amazing. Absolutely. Professional quality artwork and great stories. It's, it's quite amazing because um, I even grown up, it's, I suppose it's like anything. It's, it's, it's like, um, or similar kind of, uh, like, and possibly things like music and things like that. But if you're, um, um, if you're wanting to become known, you just, you know, like, I think most uh, 
be up with young people when, when they're starting out, particularly like ones that want to get involved in the comics. It, the dream is Marvel and DC. And I think mm-hmm. um, what's, what's been amazing about the internet in general and, and like things like Kickstarter and as I say, I noticed parallels in music with um, people being able to put their own stuff up on YouTube or self-publish and then fire their stuff straight on Spotify and things like that. It's yeah. like you're the middleman mm-hmm. and just get to, um, you know, to people who are interested in, in buying it, supporting you. Um, yeah. when, I, when I was younger, I really wanted to be a comic artist and um, I ended up kind of, it was like, it's the start of the noughties and I was like, I'm going to have to pack this in and get a proper job because there's no way that I can feasibly do this unless I get picked up by Marvel or, or DC. But then uh, time went on, Kickstarter became a thing. And I, I'd, I'd gotten into illustration stuff and I was like, um, it seems like the stuff I used to want to do, I could now do. So I have a wee career change, I can get back into that. And, that's kind of what I've done. That's amazing. Um, so, uh, <laughs> where did we get started? Like, where, where did you, where did you, um, what was your first? I think it's quite funny. You asked me just before we went to air, like, <laughs> how far back are we going to go? <laughs> and I didn't really answer your question. Um, where, what was it? So, you said like you're quite young and you wanted to get into Marvel and DC. Um, yeah. and, um, what were your, what, what were your first sort of steps into the profession of illustration and? And comic book art. Yeah. But when I'm back, when I was doing comic stuff, I was like still at school. I was a bit obsessed with Batman and uh, Star Trek comics, and I was just making my own my own comics based on that. But I never really made any progress on uh, trying to become a professional because I didn't really know what to do. There was no internet back then to kind of find out. So I just kept drawing and drawing, and then uh, eventually, I was like, I'm not sure this is going to go anywhere. I'm going to have to get a proper job. Or so my teachers kept telling me. Um, so I went to uh, uh, went to college and kind of learned a whole illustration thing. I was at college for a good few years, then I went to art school and kind of got a broader education in uh, in art in general. And I graduated in 2009 and I was doing the professional illustration thing since then and a better start of an artist thing as well in between. Awesome. What did you, what were you drawing? What was your, uh, what, what was your uh, professional illustration commissions? What were you doing? Uh, Started the kind of earliest ones I had was like zombie book covers in the back about 2010 when everybody was really into zombies. So all my work was uh, zombie book covers. Um, as I kind of went on from that to like, because you kind of, when you start as a professional straight, you need to kind of build, build up word of mouth, get a kind of yeah. snowball thing going so you get bigger jobs. So eventually I started doing work for like a, a game company, so like Ruffian Games, uh, Boston Studios. Um, ended up working for, um, Oh, what called Holland and Sherry, the suit designers, fabric designers for, for a while, doing yeah. like uh, kind of characters and guys and suits for them. So oh, cool. Kind of variety, like some weird stuff. <laughs> I mean, kind of yeah. from like really interesting stuff for like games companies to like really mundane stuff for like the local council. That that designs for a swimming pool uh, for a local council. That's uh, quite amazing, man. Like. Came of it. <laughs> Jobs at it, I've completely forgotten about it. <laughs> That's amazing. There's nothing like going in at the deep end, eh? Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry about the puns there. Um, oh, I, I wanted so to ask you about the uh, the whole theme of hard code because mm. uh, it's kind of sci fi, um, cyberpunk yeah. um, inspired, and I wondered kind of where that had come from. Uh, the theme, so it's kind of like, um, it's like a combination of all the things that interest me, so like taking my. Um, my kind of most inspiration, inspirational artists like Mobius, uh, Musumi Shiro, and kind of try to combine all the kind of themes that they do, which kind of um, uh, comedy, cyberpunk, sexuality, and make it into a kind of book that's stylish but not uh, doesn't take itself too serious. Does that make sense? That's almost like I'm trying to make the kind of book that, that I would uh, really like to see myself. It's kind of loosely based on stuff that people I admire have done in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So quite a, a homage to the people that have inspired you, the artists that have inspired yeah. you. But it's a bit it's a bit naughty as well though, Craig. Um, uh, I'm going to ask you about this. You know, you've been teasing us with these uh, slightly naughty pictures over the last few weeks um, and, and they seem to be getting them, um, catching people's attention, shall we say. <laughs> it's definitely getting a lot of uh, feedback on uh, on social media, it's a <laughs> new kind of experimental direction from artwork, kind of doing the, uh, not like 
not pornographic scenes or anything, but more kind of like romance, kind of sexual scenes and stuff. And we're kind of kind of more into it. I think it's a it's been quite a difficult uh, path to take. So so much you have to uh, have have right when you're doing that. Like it needs to be emotionally right. You need to have your anatomy perfect. The gesture needs to be right. It's it's been tough. Uh, I don't remember the, the last time I've kind of like tried to introduce something new to my work, and it's been such a kind of struggle. But I feel, I feel like I'm getting there with it. So I'd add in kind of proper emotion and motion to my work. Yeah, there's a, there's a wee bit of sort of cyber sex going on there with your yeah. your wanker robotic technology. That's wanker. <laughs> I just hasten to to, to say, <laughs> um, and then um, and that that's been that's quite interesting. Um, and I, I see that um, Kiltopia is kind of going down that route as well, with the, the kind of theme of sex dolls, cyber sex dolls. And, you know, it, it reminded me, actually, not so long ago, a few months back, there was, you know, uh, before lockdown, so it was quite a long time ago, then there was a story in the press about somebody, I don't know if it was Glasgow, Kilmarnock, that sort of area, some guy who had bought these very lifelike sex dolls and had effectively bought up his own brothel. <laughs> with these dolls, um, Jeff's going to censor me now. Oh, um, no. And I just wondered if you'd read that. <laughs> and I your mind and thought, I'm going to do, I'm going to do some artwork about this. <laughs> I didn't hear that story specifically, but I remember uh, there's Lars, the real girl film with uh, Ryan Gosling. Oh, it goes around, yeah. he's, uh, it's, it looks like a kind of corpse he's carrying around and it's made of rubber. Yeah. Creepy uh, stuff. That, that, that story was definitely in the press not so long ago, maybe about a year or so ago. But apparently, it's, he's, he's not doing anything illegal because okay. it's just a it's just a very lifelike sex doll from um, Japan. Yeah, it seems like in, in fiction, sex sex dolls are kind of cool and kind of interesting, like sex androids. But in real life, they're just creepy, like having yeah. a baby that you carry around. Uh huh. Yeah. It could be cool as well. Oh, God, me, I don't know. Oh, what's the film with the the one that Firefly follows on from? Um, Serenity. Yeah. 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 There's a there's a there's a an android kind of character in that who is is it Mister? He's called Mister Universe or something like Mister Galaxy. I can't remember his name. There's a character in in who is in charge who's able to. It's quite amazing because like Serenity's not that old a film. It's about thirty. Oh, well, I say it's about thirteen or 40, it's older than my kid. But yeah. <laughs> um, it, it doesn't strike me as that older film, but they, they do play around with a, a, quite that sort of cyberpunk aesthetic for aspects yeah. of the film. Um, and they have like the Mr. Galaxy, the universe character who is able to like plug into all communication networks. And so he, 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 he monitors transmissions for, um, for the main characters, but he also has a, a robotic kind of playmate kind of doll that like hangs around yeah. with him. But she's yeah. very obviously robotic, and actually, we're now getting to a stage. Obviously, Serenity's Serenity set a couple hundred years in the future, but we're now getting to a stage now where actually, I think that almost looks antiqu- antiquated. <laughs> even mm-hmm. even like, even the, the very obvious robotic movement of what's of this character. Something that looks antiquated. Like <laughs> making it a uh, act on its own with its own kind of AI and stuff. Yeah, no, we've the challenges. Uh, but Firefly was definitely a series that was cut off way ahead of its time. Uh, it was ahead of its time. Yeah. I, you know, and I know she watches the show, but I was talking to my friend Caroline today, and uh, about she's just come out of isolation. And I asked her; she was she's been asking folk on Facebook, like, "What should you know?" The, the inaugural, right? I'm stuck in the house for two weeks. What do I watch? And I was like, "Watch Firefly," and she had no idea what I was talking about. I was, I was, I was actually like. That's never happened before. <laughs> I, was like, oh, really? I always get really jealous of people that I've never heard of or never seen like really cool classic movies or TV shows because they get the benefit of being able to watch it all over again, discover it for the first time. Mm-hmm. It feels oh, like, yeah, everything yeah. Really, we've seen already. So yeah. never, never it, you're angry at them, but you're also very, very jealous because you're like, oh my god, yeah. you're going to experience that moment yeah. before <laughs> an anger based on jealousy. <laughs> um, I what I really like about Kiltopia, and I, one of the questions I want to ask you, um, Kiltopia is very satirical, and I know that's a big part of Dave Cook's writing is to like play about satire and, pop, and like a lot of um, 
um, a lot of the stuff regarding uh, product placement and, all, and and things like that are, uh, are are how how much within your art style did you have a did you have a like a, a creative element mm. uh, bit to that? I, I know that you've obviously um, if I pull up your uh, your pictures here, there's pit, this is the pictures of, that you've drawn for Kiltopia, but there's obviously you've got this ongoing. Uh, let's see if I can find a hand again because it's my favorite. Yeah, uh, Wanker Robotics. Um, it's fine. Uh, uh, how popular that Wanker Robotics one was. Cause, um, it's, so, it's, it's, so, it's it's so it's it's genius because it's it's, it's <laughs> such a it's such a toilet humor joke. But it's, it's um it's um it's there's a, there's an element of satire to that at all, as well, which is quite incredible. <laughs> I don't know. It was just like a kind of funny wee sketch and like a joke. It wasn't really all that funny to begin with, and then uh, I made it into this, and then Mark Miller retweeted it. And, People are laughing at us. <laughs> That's him. That's what you want, though. If you know Mark Miller thinks you're funny, then you're like, there you go, fight. Okay. You know, <laughs> working on something like how it's going to be received. Like I'll be working on something thinking, oh, nobody like this. It's just a quick throwaway thing. And so it always seems to be like the things that you don't uh, you don't take too seriously that end up kind of correcting you. Go. I mean, if the, the more you kind of overwork something, spend a lot of time focusing on it, it starts to become kind of robotic kind of loses that kind of human element that appeals to people. I think with the one kind of robotics thing is just I did it quite well, I did it for fun and that maybe comes across. Mm -hmm. the, more, the more enjoyment you have in your own artwork, the more people enjoy it. I, I, know a lot of comedy, I know a lot of comedy writers talk about that where they um they have the or and and movie directors and and they have that whole thing where they um they write the things that are going to be the prevalent thing like the 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 thing that they think is going to be the, the bit that takes off and the funny bit and then but obviously when you put thing when you put media out to the rest of the world for consuming and 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 you know what what you think is going to be the the thing that everybody takes from it is is very is uh, i'm trying to think of an example i know um the guys who made uh, the room uh the guys who made the room yeah. a serious film and then uh had to change it to comedy at the last minute because there was lyrics <laughs> totally. Just um, yeah, what, what gets picked up. Um, I was thinking, um, uh, we, like, I love. I, I'm a big fan of like the total meme. I don't know if you want to call it meme culture, but like the stuff that folk, folk take out of films. Like, I love that. Like, out of that quite amazingly intense movie, Yango and Chained, the, the prevalent thing is that uh, is that ongoing the Leonardo DiCaprio laughing face that just appears everywhere. I'm like, how has that been the thing? That <laughs> <laughs> and that really crazy barmy film. That's the thing everybody now remembers that movie for. Gabriel's got a good face for memes. He's appeared on a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for laughter. And then I'm always getting mauled. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did forget that one. My favourite one this week, um, I've been sharing on my Facebook. I love how in the, the TV series The Boys, it's uh, there's there, there's this whole thing about deep now, and I know the deep's like a horrible, horrible character. When you if you go into the backstory, he's, he's he's a horrendous human, um, and and but he's become almost like the he's he's he's, he's become the butt of the practical, you know, the butt of all of the jokes and this um, this stuff with the what's the is a fresca the, the the drink and how he gets total tied up with Scientology and things like that is um that's become like. <laughs> The prevalent running joke, um, yeah. I've noticed on the internet. I'm like, I wonder if the guys, like, you can go right back to like even like Anna Train, the comic. Like, at what point did he think, um, you know, when, when this becomes a TV show, folk are going to be making jokes about the Aquaman esque character and how, how he's just a, you know, he, he's, he's such a silly character that people actually now are starting to feel sorry for him. Uh, back when they were writing the boys for the first time, that this is the way it would turn out and how it would be received. Mm. <laughs> uh, I've only seen the second season of uh, the boys. I'm kinda, I was waiting for it all to be out so I could just spend watch it. Oh man, it's good. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of folk have been doing that because I know Amazon did it on, on Amazon on purpose. Don't, thought I don't know. I I think there's been several versions of the story. One story is that, like apparently. Amazon had turned around and said, "No, we we want to avoid binge fatigue. Where folk just folk 
don't get the impact of the episodes because they watch them all in a winner, which is a fairly it's a fairly mm-hmm. justifiable argument. But then somebody else, I was speaking to somebody who was saying, no, um, if what happened, what they, what Amazon noticed last year was when they released a series, people use their one month free mm-hmm. to like binge binge it all, yeah. and then um, and then so Amazon will know notice like you know they'll, they'll put they'll pump all this money into the boys for example. They'll get loads of views that month, and then then they'll notice like a, a sizable drop in, in mm-hmm. viewership. Mm-hmm. So by releasing it once a week, you have to have you know you you, you have to have had Amazon Prime for three months if you want yeah, to work. Like social media discussion going as well. It's like a you know the whole time when Game of Thrones was on, uh, mm-hmm. we're talking about it every week because mm-hmm. like every episode once a week for ten weeks. And if uh, the boys come out all at once, you get people talking about it intensely for a week, and then. Okay. The next thing, so uh, it's spreading it out over time, kind of keeps uh, the social media profile high, keeps people talking about stuff. Oh, totally. Um, so what's next for you? What's next for you? So hard code is is doing really, really well. What's the what's the ambitions? What are you? Have you got anything coming up that you're? I've got a hard code is like the kind of first part of a, a plan that I'm kind of working on, um, and each part of it's kind of dependent on the last part being a success. So. <laughs> Hard code will go well, and it seems like it's going well so far. That's good. Um, and it's got my first kind of attempts uh, into writing. So I'm not really confident as a writer. So this, this is kind of like me sticking my, my toe into the, the pool of writing. Um, and I'll see how that's received. Um, and then next, uh, I've got planned a, kind of, um, a book that's just more like a kind of conventional comic where I've, I've written a story. Um, then it's trying to move away slightly from being strictly cyberpunk, kind of going more towards uh, sci-fi action comedy with a little bit of cyberpunk. Kind of much more like uh, Mr. Mishiro's Dominion Tank Police, something along those lines. Oh, but cool. with sexiness. <laughs> so I, I see you did um, a, a bit of artwork for Monty Nero for his Frenemies comic. We had oh, Monty yeah. on the show last week. Was it? Um, it was just kind of um, it was teased earlier in the, in, in the week, but then released that you'd done a like a variant cover almost uh, with the, yeah. the the multiple characters and the, you finding you're getting more kind of comic related stuff now uh, commissions. Okay, pretty much all my commissions are comic related stuff now. So yeah, uh, moving doing comics has has made a massive improvement to my uh, my, my career. Mm-hmm. Um, before, like I was saying, it was just illustration, professional illustration, just all the kind of like developed jobs. Yeah. It wasn't so are, are you kind of thumbing your nose at your, your school teachers now? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I think school teachers pretty much all thought I was going to be always on a way to. My, my, my school was kind of like on the border of a kind of, um, a kind of a posh part and a poor part in Glasgow. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I was, I was with kind of kids from the poor side, so we were kind of. They cast aside it at the start of the years, just for our backgrounds, and they focused all their energies on the on the posh kids. So we've yeah. got a bit on this about my time at school. Goodness, that's a shame. Yeah, mm. yeah. There's there was a bit of debate I think on on Twitter this past week about um, school and 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 art and um, in particular art teachers really having a downer on on comic book art and manga. Um, which is incredibly popular amongst you know that sort of age group, um, and I I even remember it myself. Um, I liked drawing comic book style stuff when I was doing art at school, but uh, but the teachers hated it that much that I ended up not even doing art as a qualification at school yeah. because I was like and I wasn't interested in doing, you know pictures yeah. of my shoe. Uh, when I was at school, it was a kind of narrow-minded view of art. It's like yeah. the, the, the art teachers kind of telling you all these stories about history of like. How every every few decades or so, this new art form comes along that the kind of old artists and the old uh, art historians don't like. They don't accept it, and then it becomes the new norm and it becomes the latest thing. And that's just yeah. been how art history's progressed through the years. And they're just they're telling us these stories, but then doing the same thing that they've just told us that these you know uneducated art historians from the past have done by dismissing the new big thing. Yeah. And I think uh, like in the nineties, the two thousands, comics and manga was the kind of the new uh, the new art style, I guess, and, and digital art. Um, 
they couldn't like look kind of beyond the kind of surface of it and see that this is a kind of a new emerging art form that uh, you know you have to you have to understand the kind of basic fundamental uh, fundamentals of art to be able to do it properly. And they could have they could have taught it to us that way rather than just dismissing it because there must be so many people that um, were really into art and then were put off art by their own art teachers because of like that's not proper. You need to copy from that's the art. Mm. That's so, I, um, I, I never did art or anything like that and I've got no artistic bones in my body but I, I, I do notice so that Studio Ghibli put out um, I, I don't know if you know, Studio Ghibli have put out frames I'll need to find the, 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 the website so I'm not talking out my bum but um, I'm sure like, Studio Ghibli have done like somebody within the studio has just screenshot like obviously that I'm, 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 I'm paraphrasing the actual very intensive art process they've done but they've screenshotted multiple like i think it's like 200 shots from each of their films and and they're, yeah uh, yeah that's it that's exactly what it's called and they're releasing them online so people can just print them and frame them and then um, like to be you know like, like you're saying there like manga and anime and comic style and just animation in general isn't isn't regarded as a highbrow or like acceptable art form, but it, it clearly is. And like, imagine there's going to be, you know, there's going to be loads of folk doing that. You know, like, and what is art? How, how do you how do you quantify? It? How do you tell somebody that that's not an acceptable art form when? Yeah, it's just like, maybe, maybe 50, 60 years ago, people were kind of raging at cubism, saying that's not, that's not proper art. That's not real. You need to go back and do your proper impressionism. That's real art. And then 50 years before, people were like, oh, Impressionism, that's not, that's not real art. You need to go back to your realistic style. And it's yeah. just kind of, the cycle kind of continues. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm not going to lie, like, I've only ever been to the, 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 the Gallery of Modern Art in Edinburgh, which is an incredible place. I've only been there once. And it was because Escher was there. Well, he wasn't yeah. personal. But <laughs> <laughs> his work was. And I'm like, actually, you know, I can imagine at some point folk were like, fuck's this? What is this? Like, <laughs> why does the water come back on itself? What's why? Why, why are we? Why are we talking about this? Is that an art form? And I'm like, well, I don't know, but I just paid a tenner because it's quality. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> First time you see it, I guess. Yeah, totally. Uh, it's like a new stuff with perspective, to kind of create things that don't exist in real life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, where can we find out about? You know, we mean me and Colin know your stuff because <laughs> we were long time fans. But if, if folk wanted to check you out a wee bit more, wanted to follow you, wanted to, um, um I've got a I've got the Hard Code Kickstarter on just now. It started on uh, Saturday, and you can, you can find that on Kickstarter. So by searching Hard Code, um, be careful searching for Hard Codes on Google or. Uh, <laughs> Make sure you get that key in there, right? <laughs> in the yard. Uh, a lot of adult themed websites tend to spell <laughs> wrong. I think they've only got a spell check on run that's uh, changed. I, if I'm honest, I Googled you and I Googled Kickstarter and I was able to get the hard code link really, really quickly. So uh, that's, good, that's good news. <laughs> without, without, without stumbling across like pornography. <laughs> uh, so if I, if I, Try to set up like uh, people that have backed uh, Kickstarter on Twitter so I can say thanks, or backed uh, Hardcode on Twitter so I can say thanks to them. I have to search through the term Hardcode. Some of the stuff that comes up is pretty unpleasant. <laughs> I bleach afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, You're you on social media as well, yeah? I, I'm, uh, I'm on Twitter as, uh, as uh, Big Bean, one of the most imaginative of names. But, and, uh, I'm on Instagram as creating an illustration. It's not mm -hmm. that bad. Well. well, that was weird. Did you see the graphic there? Look, it just it, it fades out the word illustration. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought that would be a, a fresh cut, but it wasn't. That's weird. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, oh, Colin, have you got any more questions before we let Craig go and talk about Oh, nonsense? no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not gonna put them under any more pressure um just uh, to say um you know well done so far with the yeah uh, starter. Definitely. it's got still got what three weeks to go or something so um uh, awesome um we'll be keeping an eye on it and uh, rooting thank for you thank you
Magic. Cool. We'll speak to you soon, buddy. Uh, take care. Cheers. It's quality. Now, thank you so much for joining us, Craig. That was really, really good. Um, yeah, total. Um, I, we didn't talk about it. I'm going to fire this up as well because that, that's the website I've been using with Craig's work. Um, Artstation.com uh, slash four slash Craig Payton. Um, that's where I was, you know, the stuff with the, the robotic arms and um, the, the, the front cover hard code and that's all there. And it's phenomenal. Um, yeah. It's yeah, it's uh, looking great. Um, I'm, I'm interested to see the rest of the stuff because he's obviously been teasing a few of the illustrations, but there's a whole lot more to come. I just yeah. want to also just have a shout out to Heather, um, Craig's uh, partner, um, who is also a graphic designer and has had a, a bit of an influence on the the shape of the book as well. So you all of those. Uh, There's a wee nod to Heather. All of those uh, editors in the background that don't get you know <laughs> um, that that do more work than we we we, we sometimes realise. There's uh, there'll be all the other stuff. There'll be the the freak, the freak outs at two in the morning when you just they're like, oh my god, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that. Uh, between you and my wife, uh, a bizarre background editing team that was like, oh my God, Colin, I'm freaking out and you're like, no, it's fine. <laughs> this is just a thing. <laughs> um, uh, how's your week been? It's been a busy week. <laughs> it's been a busy week because you've been keeping me busy this week. Sorry. Um, I, did not, I did not know if you had a, you had a slide on Tuesday or Wednesday where you were like, yeah, it's my week off and I've just done all this comic shit. Yeah, I'm having to do all this bloody comic shit. Yeah, uh, well, the week was fairly busy. Uh, signing my commando comic on Saturday there. Like the, the, that was um, 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 I should have got the. I should have loaded up the picture beforehand. But it was really cool coming along the Maygate, which is a really nice bit of Dunfer one anyway. So you've got the library, and then you've got like obviously the Cowden and Craft Beer Merchant, where we buy all our craft beer, and then the comic shops just a couple of doors down, lot shop of heroes. Seeing your name on a sign. I went up. I went up with a name on a sign. Yeah. Oh, but it was, it was like, not quite in lights, but a sign. No, no. But um, I mean, I took a. I took Sonny, obviously, who's my four-year-old who is just learning phonetics, and I got him to read, and he was able to read your name because he knew like call, and he went through it, and he got there. He was like, "Was oh, that say Colin?" I was like, "Yeah." Amazing. And then we put. I pointed over, and you could see you in the window where the, he was like. <laughs> So it was it was quick. That was that was a weird kind of proud father moment. But nah, I was really proud of you when we went in. I was prouder of you than you were. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was nice to meet meet people when there was a few kind of long term commando fans that come along as well. So that was awesome. Yeah, so um, that was uh, that was my weekend. Sunday I had Sunday off. No, I went for lunch. I think on Sunday. Um, <laughs> before, before before you shift away from Saturday. Uh -huh. Did you feel? Um, I, I was, I was wondering. I was sitting drinking beer on Saturday night and wondering this. Were you slit? Do you think you were any busy or less busy because of? So was that quite a busy event for you on Saturday compared to other events, or was it just kind of? Um, I, I don't know. Did lots of events, and um, it was kind of a medium event. <laughs> I was interested because I remember during the start of lockdown, we we, we both noted how. There was a horrible thing where you had loads and loads of um you had loads and loads of like you know you're like me you just click um interested in going to all these events every week and then on like a monday you'll get a reminder of the hundred events that you said that you were going to go to um and then obviously that and then that became like quite a depressing thing throughout the year as you're like oh yeah i was going to go to that that and that this week and um, i was just wondering like Obviously, I had I had your signing down as an event on my Facebook calendar, and I was like, "Oh!" and I was really excited to go, and I went, and it was great. And um, I would, yeah, I spent a good twenty minutes in the, the comic shop and had a really nice time. And Sonny was enjoying himself and everything; it was lovely. Um, I was just, I was wondering if, like, because of the lack of events that are going on, you got a wee bit more interest than you might have, or I don't know. There was a lot of people who were interested, but quite a few people. I think on the day couldn't make it and we did get the shop got some messages i got some messages from folks saying oh you know i can't make it but you know could, could the shop keep me a copy or could you send me a copy of the, the comic if, if possible so i've got actually a few to, to send off and post to people that's good um so, i read it it's brilliant man i really really enjoyed it 
Um, obviously, you sent me a you sent me a draft of the script, and obviously you told me about the story well before it was handed in as a um, to actually just see it though. It was great, really, really good. Um, I, I thought it was brilliant. Um, no, it was just good. <laughs> I don't really know what to say. Oh, and, uh, uh, that um, Manuel Bennett's art style is just is good, and it, it um it it was pretty much as I say. I can remember about maybe a year ago. I can't remember where we were. Or maybe drive was it maybe the time we went through to meet um uh, Barry Lumsden and Stephen Ingram. We went through to Edinburgh, I think. I think I was maybe around about the first time you told me the story. I don't know, or thereabouts. Mm. So, so um which is like um to, to, and your your rendition of the story was perfect. You know, in comparison, like I think obviously I think that's probably a reflection on how good a writer you are, because um uh, Manuel's art style is great, but it was like I envisioned exactly. I, will you tell me your story and reading your script. I, 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 I don't know if there is me part of me looking at it going, I know in my, my brain, I was like, I kind of know what the Commando Comics style of art is, mm. and I'm reading your script, so I was envisioning what that would look like on paper, and it was. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that, that, I, well, that. I, that was my experience as well when yeah. I started to see um, Manuel's artwork, and I was thinking. Did did you read my mind? Because yeah. that's exactly what it was in my head when I was yeah. writing that scene, you know. And I was quite amazed. That's quite that's quite fascinating. I wonder. But I wonder. He has, been, he has been doing Commando comics for like forty years. So oh, uh, uh, totally. And then uh, uh, then uh, uh, we we're talking about psychology earlier. I wonder if it's psychology to that. So like with I uh, just I think the whole experience from an outsider quite fascinating. Reading it and being like knowing what to expect, having read some Commando comics that you've lent me and some of the stuff from when I was very young, having a, like, I don't know if your understanding of Commando comic structure influenced your writing or, um, oh, it was just weird. It was, like I said, like the way you told me the story and the way I read it and you, you like you said, like, Manuel, Manuel reading your mind, almost. That's, that, that's, that's quite an incredible. I wonder, I wonder if that's quite, you know, we talk about like when you're younger and you want to write for DC and Marvel. I wonder if that's, I wonder if that's quite a, a, an experience that a lot of writers and artists experience as they move into mainstream comics. Mm, that, I expect um, the probably is, yeah. I, I, I expect so. Um, I have to say though, I've never, ever um, had an inclination for working for Marvel or DC, um, mainly because they weren't a thing in my life as a kid. You know, where I lived, you didn't get those comics. You didn't get American comics. Not easily. Mm. You know, you had to go miles away or to get them. Or, and they were quite expensive anyway, but you could get them. Um, you could certainly get all the um, DC Thompson, you know, comics yes. easily. And Warlord and Victor and, and that. Um, and less so the sort of Fleetway IPC stuff like, uh, like Battle and, and things. Um, mm. You could get them, but not as they never seem to appear as frequently as the DC Thompson stuff. So that was my my influence. You know, way back was those comics, and then yeah. now to be working for them is pretty pretty amazing. amazing. Stephen Mackey and uh, Mackay, sorry, has said Commando comics were brilliant back in the day. Are they still around? Yes, they're still around. Yes. And we have on our staff. One of their writers. <laughs> um, yeah, they, they, they publish eight comics every month. So every fortnight, there's four comics. Two of them are reprints of old ones, and two of them are brand new stories. So, yeah. Was there a brand new story this week, Colin? Sorry? <laughs> was there a brand new story in the last week? Uh, yeah, there was, there was a couple of brand new stories last week. <laughs> uh, and interestingly, the other brand new story was a sci-fi one. Oh, you said that the uh, um... feature, featuring uh, like clone troopers. That was quite an interesting one, um, and uh, I, I, I can't wait to see uh, this week's commandos. I haven't got them yet, though. Though today's the day that they come out in W. H. Smith, um, I haven't received my subscription ones yet, but that's not unusual um, to get them a day or two late. But there's a new writer, J. P. Bridson, has written oh. a story called uh, I think it's Third Time Lucky. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to see what who he's writing about because I always like reading the new stories first to see you know what, what's new and kind of current. Yeah, you know, that's what that's other cool. writers are thinking about. 
it is yeah that, that must be quite a it's something i think a lot of people don't think about maybe is different like, like yourself new writers like uh, you wrote for commando comics but your story the euro is very it's, it's quite new and i think or like the the whole agatha christie-esque story set in like it's set in, in in during world war Two, i think is 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 quite niche and as you said like different writers are are, are, yeah. are taking it in a different direction absolutely um, Steve, i think a lot will go for the kind of traditional kind of stories this the same themes and things but um my approach is to try and come up with something just a bit different and if i can yeah. you know work in a romance or something into it and which, which i've done in another story which you know might get published um or if i can work in another kind of genre then i'd, I'd like to do that i mean yeah. i'm sure most of the the writers at the moment are probably looking at the the sci-fi one thinking oh i wonder if i could write a sci-fi yeah you know kind of war story um it's not the first time there's been a sort of science fiction one and it did it did cause quite a lot a bit of a stir you know there's been mixed mixed um responses i've seen online but um quite a lot of people going back and looking at their old commandos that had a bit of a sci-fi theme as well you know to say you know this isn't really something that's new it has been kind of looked at before Sorry. Um, you should absolutely, uh, Stephen, look out for them. You can go yeah, on to the Smith is the best place to get them, but you can subscribe and there's a there's a good deal, something like um, 26 issues for a tenner or something. Yeah. Um, on at the moment, just go over to the, the DC Thompson website and look for the, the deals. But yeah, there's a, a superb deal on, um, on subscriptions like at the moment. Uh, if, if you if you like the older stuff as well, like I know we've not had any, and like I quite like to make the joke that Colin participated in one of the last comic convention live in person comic conventions and mm-hmm. of any kind in, in Scotland uh, earlier this year. But you know, we, you know, you could have gone a bit barmy in that place. You had that. You had your uh, you had your stall, and you know, what I mean, Sunny in Glasgow that came to see you, and um, I got. I think a hundred two thousand ads for like seven pound fifty, you know, like and but that, that that's what I was looking for. Um, imagine if you were looking for um, Commando comics, you probably would have got quite a similar deal, you know. Um, but yeah, absolutely. And there was folk. I mean, I've got a lot of old Commando comics, which you know I've either bought or inherited, or people have given me, and I took a, a whole bunch along there, you know. And there was guys coming along and having a good week through looking. Mm-hmm. People are trying to make their, their entire collection, you know. There's what nearly five and a half thousand commando comics now um and and folk are are, are trying to get the, the entire collection and there's, there are a few people that have you know so these sorts of events you'll find people coming along and they don't have a list of the ones yeah. they're looking for or they might be looking for better versions you know better kept yeah. um, versions of ones that they've already got i find that um that's a good point um as i said i, I bought loads of 2000 ad's at the start of the month uh, start of the year, sorry. And there's a couple that have been, um, somebody quite annoyingly um, has written. I imagine it was probably the the original news agent has written in pen in the corner the name of the person. And, and I remember yeah, getting that's not unusual, yeah, yeah. Um, and it was usually in pencil. But if I if I were buying the Beano when I was like what mm-hmm. five or six years old. Um, in a wee corner shop in Dunfermline, they would write uh, in recite. Sorry, they would write Nicholson in the corner for me, so that I knew yeah. that was my one. But um, there's some of my uh, some of my 2000 ADs um, from like the mid 80s where they've been. Written, it's like somebody's names written in pen in the yeah. corner. Yeah. I'm annoyed. Yeah. I'm now like well, I've, I've moved on to the next stage of collecting where I'm like I want this exact comic again <laughs> with his name in the corner. Yeah. Well, didn't you notice that the '77 comic has a name in the corner? Yeah, yeah, I like that. That was it was if it's there on purpose. That's quite. I'm, yeah, I'm already yeah, right that. That's quite on purpose. Yeah. Uh, that's Stephen saying uh, the last war comic he bought was Fiends or the Eastern Front, 2000 AD. Oh, that's in 2000 AD. That's right. Yeah, that's the, idea current, that's the yeah. current story. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I've got. I've got. I'm. I'm a couple of weeks behind on 2000 AD. Um. I was going to say something about 2080 this week, and it's totally, it's, it's totally just getting my mind. Um, <laughs> 2080. No, no. Um, there was a really interesting Judge, uh, Judge Dredd story that started about two weeks ago, and uh, that I'm that I'm following, where it's the idea that um, 
it's it's about the um the administration element of dealing with crisis in Mega City One. And it's real, I, I, as a as somebody that works in education, it's really fascinating because um there's there's genuinely about two or three pages on, on like I think it's the start of the new bout of stories where there there's it's literally a lady looking at <laughs> graphs and trying to work out how to how to balance the books of Mega City One's public spending, and it's really interesting. <laughs> I was like. Wow, you, you found a book, a story about accounting interesting. Wow. <laughs> it's really interesting, though. Well, um, that's that, that is one talented writer, then. Oh, yeah, I yeah, can turn that into a story. But, um, it's interesting because, um, for the last what 16 weeks of uh, the last 16 weeks of 2008, there's been this um epic story about um the four horsemen of the apocalypse coming and all that sort of stuff. That's now been dealt with, and it's about the aftermath and how, how do you rebuild. A city that's been destroyed because of, and actually, <laughs> it's all through graphs and <laughs> I can't even say it. it's great. It's really really interesting. Actually, I thought it was um, I was like, oh, um, I was I don't know if I was ready for a new just read story, but now nah, this one's quite good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? There's a commando out this week that is the Four Horsemen. Oh really? But um, okay. it's a good. I haven't read it obviously because I haven't got it, but um, it, it looks as though it's a, you know those. Um, Italian, I think they're Italian, white horses, lipizzaners or something they're called. You know, that yeah. they're kind of, I don't know, dancing kind of horses. Yeah, 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 you know, know. Well, it's a, it's a story about them, apparently. It looks as though there's like, you know, some sort of, you know, mission to try and save them or something during during World War Two. Oh, that's um, cool. I like so that. It's fair kindly um, as a writer who's, you know, a long term. Uh, commando writer, so I'm sure it'll be good. But I know I'm really looking forward to reading that one. That must happen quite a lot more, though. Eh? There's that whole thing about um, like finding your own, finding the importance in your mission and things like that. I am. Um, that's pretty cool. I like that. What's your beer been like this week? Um. Well, I've got a beer with me tonight. You know, well, last week I did. You know, I, I made a bit of an error. I went to the went to town to go to the call and um, the beer shop yesterday. Not realising that he's on reduced hours and he's only open Thursday through to yeah. Saturday. So um, the Caledonian craft beer merchant wasn't open yesterday or else I would have had a fancy beer. So I ended up just getting another off-tempo from Asda. This time it's a cloudy pale ale, 6.1%. Um, not the first time I've had it and I like it. It's, it's decent for £2.20 a can. So it's tasty beer. I um I went to the I went to the wee Asda because we've got in in Dunfermline there's um more I imagine the towns have a, a very similar kind of um lookout but we have in in Dunfermline where we live you have the big Asda and the wee Asda or as my um as my wife sometimes calls the wee Asda the dirty Asda. <laughs> <laughs> um, near the wee Asda, live the wee Asda. big Asda. Um, <laughs> I live next to the wee Asda, so I went in there to buy off Tempo because you. would because you mentioned it, and it, it, yeah, I forget that you live closer to the big Asda than the wee Asda, so, so I got my Asda. Um, we didn't have any of those ones. I did buy this in Tesco's this week. This is what I've just finished drinking. It's called a uh, Shoop, and it's a it's a New England IPA, uh, hazy, six point four percent. It's salt and Pomona Island. Um, it's all right. Two pounds, uh, sorry, three pound twenty. I think that cost me. Um, which is interesting because that's quite expensive for a supermarket. But um, you know, you're almost version into like niche like mm. shops with that kind yeah. of price. It's okay, really juicy. Um, I, I did enjoy it. Um, what's quite interesting I noticed about the uh, um the can is it it, it boasts that it's, it's smooth with a lone bitterness. And I noticed quite a, a quite an intense bitterness in this one. Don't know if it's maybe just unlucky with the can. But um, I would drink this again. I quite like the bitterness in beer. Um, a couple of uh, a couple of hops that I I don't normally drink: Enigma hops and Muteka hops. No, oh, right. Yeah, um, but there was Vic Secret in there as well, and that was the one I did notice. That kind of weird kind of Vic Secret's got that weird kind of pineapple esque, mm. the kind of floor like a, a really tropical floral. It's how kind of I don't know. Maybe talking. Pish, but that's kind of what I associate Vic Secret with being. Um, 
that kind of low low key um, tropical kind of um, kind of hop. That was okay. Um, I quite happily buy loads of them. Um, I say three pound twenty a can. Also, um, my boss, as a thank you for a really tough, uh, a really tough um, term at work, gave me twelve pounds in she, uh, with twelve pound in Marks and Spencer's vouchers with the intention to spend that on. Uh, they do a meal for two for twelve pound. Mm -hmm. So me and my wife could have a romantic, and I just spent it on wine and beer. Um, but uh, they've got some <laughs> Marks and Spencers. I've got some really good cats. You should totally check out if you're if you've got like a Marks and Spencers, um, Marks and Spencers garage near where you stay and stuff. They do. They've they've got some deals. But I want. Um, they've got some deals with some quite good craft beer breweries mm. um, to do their own sort of exclusive. It's like Marks and Spencers exclusive beer, but they're getting. They're obviously paying. They're paying craft brewers a certain amount of money to bring it in. And the one I got was an Arbor Ale called a, uh, I think it was Ar an Arbor Ale Lazy Pale Ale. I think it's what's called or Lazy Days Pale Ale. I'll need to go and get it. But I mean, it was like one fifty a can for Arbor, <laughs> and Arbor's great. Wow. So yeah, um, nice. Um, that's pretty cool. That's about. It. Um, how yeah? Have you been reading comics this week? Of course. What the point have you? Have well, I been reading comics? Uh, I did read one um, this week. Uh, I read one. Um, I'm trying to avoid the, the topic that you're trying to drag me to. Um, <laughs> what we find? I re I can't even find the comic I read this week. I need to share it. Um, I went on Comic House and read this really awesome and um, this really awesome comic, and then I left it upstairs. And I'm now trying to look at my comic while I'm talking to you. I'm trying to look at my comic house subscription on my phone mm -hmm. my, um, to see if I can find the name <clears> of the room. I am going to put it up and I'm really, really sorry. So I will make a big song and dance about it. Um, but I read a really interesting comic to, uh, yesterday, actually, about a superhero who um, who decides he want, he uh, who decides he's, he's fed up. He's fed up of being taken for granted. Um, he is fed up of people expect like actually people getting lazy and doing dangerous things because they 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 expect him to come and rescue him. Um, and it was oh I'm annoyed that I can't remember what that comic was called. It was really good though. It was it reminded me of a weird blend of the Incredibles, the Boys. Um, it reminded me of particularly those scenes in the Incredibles where the the characters are like doing like video diaries. But just like talking about like the sort of the human aspect of trying to balance like what your work life balance if you're a superhero, it was just interesting. Um, and this character gets himself into a, a situation where the world thinks he's died protecting them, and so he decides to not change their mind. Yeah, initially he thinks that he's going to. Um, initially he thinks he's going to. He plans to maybe be dead for a couple of weeks, and then resurrect and, and then he decides that he actually kind of be harassed and that he really likes being retired and folk thinking he's dead but um he he starts um going into therapy and he joins like an like a an addiction anonymous group to try and share a story and deal with this addiction of wanting to be loved by the public um it was just pretty good i'll need to find out what's called you're gonna have to find out what's called yeah absolutely yeah, I mean, can uh, you <laughs> For thirty seconds, while I go and get my go and get my tablet. <laughs> yeah, I, I will talk about comics and I've read. So um, this week, I managed to catch up with the Wellington, um, which I think I got issue one at the end of last year. I think it's dated, certainly dated December twenty nineteen. So I maybe got it in January this year. And obviously, with lockdown and everything, it's taken a long time. So issue five, which is the the last one in this arc, finally um, arrived in the comic shop. What is it about? Well, Wellington is the, the Duke of Wellington. So I quite like the, the idea of taking a, a character that you know exists in history and making a fictional story around them. So we've got the Duke of Wellington, who in Scotland is famous for wearing um, a road cone on his, on his head. So the famous statue of the Duke of Wellington on his horse. Um, this is the same character. So it's set in the early 1800s, the first half of the 1800s. Um, following the Duke of Wellington, and um, he's a kind of monster hunter. That's kind of what he becomes in this story. So it looks as though it's going to be a, maybe a, a longer 
ongoing series or, or set of arcs, because this seems to be the first one. It remains to be seen whether it's popular enough to go go ahead. Um, I know that the, the trade paperback is coming out of this um, soon, or it might even be out already. Um, it starts off with um, uh, the Duke of Wellington sitting in his big house, um, and this journalist arrives, and, and the journalist is there to become his sort of biographer. And um, he basically tells the journalist that, you know, everything that they've read about him is, is a lie. And, um, you know, get your notebook out, I'm going to tell you how it really was. And he, he, he produces this letter that he got um, inviting him to this, this uh, big mansion house somewhere in Yorkshire, I think it is, um, where there's been a, a, a missing person, a murder, and a sighting of a big black dog. And it, is, it seems a bit like um, the Sherlock Holmes story, Hound of the Baskervilles, um, initially. Yeah. So he goes there to sort of investigate, but um, there appears to be some sort of occult or arcane uh, overtones to the story. Um, there's, a, there's an old mine nearby which um, he, he follows tracks to, um, he encounters this big black dog, um, and eventually kind of gets in tow with some witches and there is some malevolent spirit um, or evil um, in the area up to no good and he has to has to defeat it. It's okay. I, I, I wouldn't say I'm totally riveted by the story. Um, um, and you it, it, it does... You mentioned that he's a monster hunter. That does remind me of there's quite a lot of... There was a Mary Shelley comic that you reviewed last year. Yes. Had, yeah, the Mary Shelley yeah. one was was kind of the same sort of thing. To, again, taking the real characters and and wrapping them up into these different stories, and that was much better than than Wellington, I have to say. That was a yeah. that was a better told story, a lot more twisty. This one's kind of very straightforward, mm. um, and it didn't really hold my attention. So because I kind of got all five, I read the whole lot sort of in one go, just so I could get, get my head around the story. Does he have a big Again. traffic shape done or anything like that? Did they bring the traffic cone into the story? Uh, the traffic cone didn't make any appearance, which is a, a bit, I, mean, I suppose back then they didn't have traffic. They had horses I, just, I, I, just wanted, I just wanted to be a sight gag about the fact you know, that it's there, like, there was, there was, you know, was, I, I was hoping for maybe, you know, he had a really cool gun, you know, some yeah. super sort of, Steampunk blunderbust or something, but yeah, that's what I mean. That's what, yeah, like when it's a bit, it was shaped, it was traffic cone. I have a, I have a football script by um, I follow a, I follow a, a Sunday League team called uh, Glasgow Wellington, and they have the traffic cone. It's like, yeah, and the, there's, there's, it had the, the, the strip's amazing, and it has all the, it has all the, the stripes, and it actually has a map of Glasgow on, on it's like so it's checks, it's a map of Glasgow. And there's a shiny, there's a tiny wee bit of orange, and it's a traffic cone on the on the silhouette of Wellington. That should have you just have to get a traffic cone in there. And um, I love that. That's the. the, the I'm, I'm going to write into them. I'll, yeah. I'll write to them and say traffic cone. You've got to get in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, that that's when you meant, immediately when you said Wellington, and that, that's pro possibly detrimental. That that's that's a shame for me because that's immediately what I think I'm like. Okay, two things about Wellington. You need to get traffic cone in there because that's quite funny, and and I know that he's a massively he's a massively influential historical character who did a lot for Scottish history and, and British history, but um he's known for he's the traffic cone guy. But also um yeah. but also never, that never mind the Napoleonic Wars and stuff. Like yeah, that. I think think thinks because of like Abraham Lincoln vampire hunter. I'm trying to think is it Pride Prejudice and Zombies? Mary Sh that Mary Shelley comic you talked about last year. Even like the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, this idea of having like historical or literacy figures from like that sort of Victorian era, or like you know the sort of the 16, 17, 18 hundreds, and putting them in situations that are supernatural when they weren't initially supernaturally regarded, is is becoming quite common. Yeah. Actually, I think for a long time people thought that was going to be the new. I think when when. The Walking Dead started, and like we went into a bit of a zombie phase. There, either just before that or just after that, there was a, or we're gonna have this craze where we, we have like historical mixed with horror. Mm. Um, and that's kind of what that reminds me of, to be honest. Even that um, the Elephant Man Merrick one that you've lent me kind of fits mm. into that somewhat as well. Um, 
uh, the comic I was talking about, it's called a relevant zero, is what it's called. The comic I was uh, discussing earlier. Um, it's by Stuart uh, Stuart Mulrin, and um, just um, it was just a nice lighthearted uh, poke at the superhero genre, and a, a lighthearted poke at um, psych, human psychology and how we deal with it. You know, uh, what I quite liked about it is there are um, the superhero the um, the, ca- the character in question whose name is a uh, uh, Mister. Mr. Stone, it was just a nice, interesting way of having a conversation about like if you had a superhero who who was like good, master, like a Mr. Incredible kind of character who is inherently good and wants to do good things, would know what I kind of know about um British society. Would we start to take advantage of that? Would 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 people start to be like? Oh, we can start to do stupid things because there's superheroes looking out for us, you know. Yeah. Can, you know, can can we do things that are, I don't know. I maybe I maybe will too. I read too much into it, but there's this whole thing. I think there's there, there's quite a lot of culture cultures in the UK that exist simply because we have an NHS. And um, mm-hmm. if we didn't yeah. have an NHS, those cultures would possibly wouldn't be as prevalent, or would be non-existent as a result. Um, yeah, Sorry. it reminds me Sorry. of uh, an incident that happened um, when I was a kid. There used to be a um, sort of public service announcement thing on the TV featuring the Green Cross Codeman, who was yeah. a sort of superhero that would teach you about you know crossing the road safely. Um, yeah, and and he, he, his kind of catchphrase or thing that he always end up the adverts was saying is uh, you know always use your Green Cross code because I won't be there when you cross the road. Um, um, was his thing, but I, I do remember um, somebody telling me this, a relative, um, and and they were with somebody and their their, their child, and the child, um, they, they were going across the road, and the child just stepped out on the road and started walking across without even looking or anything, and when they were chastised about it, they said, oh, but the, if there was, if something bad was going to happen, the Green Cross code man would get me. Yeah. You know, so... Kind of like, well, I don't need to bother looking because it's a green it's, old man, not David. Is it David Prowse? Was he he not, was David was Prowse, who was Darth Vader, yes. That's right. Who? But, but um, he got to use his own voice. Yeah, I heard that. He got to use his own voice. I, I read that. Um, I don't know if this is true or not, but I read somewhere that David Prowse didn't know he was not the voice of Darth Vader until opening night. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I, I need to, I need to fact check that, but I, I did read somewhere that he didn't realise that James Earl Jones. Was going yeah. to be voice of Darth Vader until the first. T- he, I think David Price was obviously invited to the premiere. Yeah. Apparently, it was raging. He sat the whole way through the premiere, wanting to smash um, George Lucas's face in because uh, yeah. George Lucas had told him. Even if it's not true, it would be a great story, and I would tell yeah, a good story as well. <laughs> good after dinner story. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, aye, that's. Is that us? Um, have you got any other things you want to talk about? Actually, yeah, I've been reading loads. I did mention it oh, when, I, when I got yeah, it, yeah. but I thought, I've read it now, so Rock the God. Is it good? Oh, it's great. Yeah, sequel to Rock of the Reds. Um, so I finally got it almost a year after the Kickstarter came out. Yeah. Um, in fact, we were at MCM. We were? MCM School yeah, in Glasgow. Yeah. A year ago, almost exactly a year ago, uh, John Wagner yeah. was there. He's obviously one of the writers um, of Rock of the Reds, and um, we were chatting to him, and we got um, the first part of this. So the, I think the Kickstarter had just started um, yeah. for, for Rock of the Reds. Yeah. Some um, audio feedback there. Yeah, yeah, sorry. That's so, yeah, um, yeah. So right. speaking to John at the time, um, he was saying that depending on how well the Kickstarter went, it was either, you know, if it didn't do incredibly well, then they were just going to do individual issues and do separate Kickstarters for them. But if it did very well, then um, they would do the full book. So it did incredibly well, um, and mm-hmm. they did the full book. So it took it almost a year for them to, to put it together. So written by... Uh, John Wagner and Alan Grant, illustrated by Dan Cornwall. Um, it is, I mean, we've mentioned it before in the show, but if you haven't 
if you've been under a rock for the past couple of years <laughs> and have never heard a rock in the reds, then you know what it is is um, this big space alien called Rock from the planet Arcade decides to leave and ends up going to Earth, um, and um, he takes the form of the first person that he meets, who happens to be Kyle Dixon, the football player for the Radford Reds. Um, so he becomes effectively becomes him, shrinks the real one down and puts him in sort of like cryostasis um, in his spacecraft. And he gets totally sucked into the world of football. Oh, he does see. Um, <laughs> and becomes the you know, the star player for Radford Reds. Um, meanwhile, um, there's things going on back in his home planet, and a couple of sort of kind of mean, nasty, bad guys come after him, which complicates yeah. things. And that's effectively Rock of the Reds, the first um, story. Um, but it, Rock the God is, 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 is follows on from that. Yeah, yeah, it is incredible. I don't think I think Rock of the Reds as a series um, ha- can be can be applauded enough. It's this bizarre mix of like a space saga mixed with Roy of the Rovers, mixed with that weird Hulk Hogan movie, Suburban Commando. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's just it's just it's it's quality. Um, it's, it's just really, really good. It's good gags in it. Yeah. Um, so Rock, Rock the God. Um, what happens in this one is um, Rock's mother, who is like the empress of his world, um, mm. decides that she's she's giving up or she's going to die. But apparently, they can choose when they die, um, and um, so he has to go back and kind of assume his job, you know, as taking over as ruler of the planet. Um, and he gets the opportunity to become a god. Um, can get these uh, um, amazing powers. While he's there, but he's torn between you know loyalty to his to um, his planet, but also his love of football. So he does not even go back to not in Rock the God. He's, he's they've qualified for Europe or something silly like that. And there's is that kind not... of kind of yeah. It's, 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 it's going, you know, pretty much yeah. It's, it's kind of like that. It's getting through to the kind of you know the, the, the higher leagues and stuff. Um, but what's really clever about this one is it. it meshes several different stories together. So we've got the story of the real Kyle Dixon who's been shrunk to like nine inches tall um, and and the <laughs> referee as well. So this referee had discovered Rock's secret. So Rock shrunk him down as well, put him in stasis along with Kyle. But um, for whatever reason, the stasis thing fails and the pair of them escape and they don't get on, but it ends up being kind of like being a buddy comedy as they try and escape from the spacecraft and they're only nine inches tall, what are they going to do? You know, how are they going to communicate with people? You let me, um, you let me issue one of Rock the God and I remember yeah. thinking that that was a story, that story wasn't one I was looking forward to and you always yeah. have that. Watch, like, when you and that's how it starts. starts. Yeah. It's in darkness and it's the two of them waking up, not knowing where they are and who they're with um, mm-hmm. until finally in the last the last panel there's just a chink of light there. Yeah, it's as really the cool. door opens, it is really, really well done. So that's one story that we follow, and they get into all manner of scrapes. You know, um, there used to be a sort of sixties TV show called Land of the Giants, um, and yeah. a little kind of feel of that. Um, and then, of, obviously, there's the story of of the, the football team trying to get up through the leagues and and uh, up through the league um, and win, but. There's a new boss that's bought over the 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 stadium and the football team, Malcolm Greedy, um, <laughs> and um, there's that story. He wants to sell off Kyle to Real Madrid as well. Yeah. He wants to he basically yeah. wants to shut down shut down the the whole football team, you know, and sell off the land to build houses. And you know, well, I think these are all kind of real stories. That, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's that I story. I think in the lower leagues, that kind of like a, yeah, yeah. you're putting it's legacy versus like development, isn't it? Like yeah. So that's the an, another strand to the whole thing, um, and the third strand is that some people in Rock's home world aren't happy that he's the the god, the the king or the emperor or mm-hmm. whatever, and they want the, so some assassins get sent to take him out as well. So he's got to juggle all these things. Well, he's trying to win the league, 
deal with the real Kyle being on the loose somewhere and yeah. these assassins and, and the, the the guy who's trying to shut down um, the, the club and sell him to Real Madrid. Yeah. So, you know, uh, these all kind of mess together and it's just loads of fun. It is a, a really good, it's, it's quite frantic and I, I'm glad I'm glad that that's kind of continuing on because that was one of the cool things about Rock, Rock of the Reds was he, he was struggling and it, that it's interesting because um, I'm what I think is really strong in the strong in the, particularly the writing is that at no point do you, do you feel like this, the football is any less as important as anything else. And obviously, somebody that's not massively I enjoy sport, obviously, but not massively into the actual the physical aspect of football. I think they do a really good way. Uh, John Wagner does a really good job of like there is a whole there is you, you do read it and you are like. Oh my God! Like they, they're going to take him back to his home world, but he still needs to finish this game. <laughs> and you're like, and it, um, that that juggle was handled very, very well to the point that you are like, oh, you can't take him away right now. He's still got forty five minutes in the final to go, and yeah. um, it's it's just really cleverly done. And I think that's um particularly in a lot of rocks internal dialogue is communicated quite well. Like um he 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 develops this appreciation and then like important you know he, he, he judges football as such an important aspect of his life that you, you you do go along with it as well which is quite incredible yeah totally yeah it's a great bit of writing by Wagner and Grant um, up there with all their kind of classic stuff that they did yeah. in 2000 AD and, and no, of course Battle I. and Scream and all the other comics that they worked on totally Agreed. so yeah highly recommended buy it now Oh, and also, I just have to mention this as well. I didn't realise I was getting this, but also what I got was, and I don't have it with me, unfortunately, but um, the 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 strip um, is is um, sponsored by Laser Tools, which is a real company who really <laughs> did, but helped back the Kickstarter to get their, their logo on the. Oh yeah, yeah I remember that. But mm-hmm. what, what came in the package with the comic was also a key ring, which is like the football top. Oh yeah, with Laser Tools on it. Right, but if you squeeze it, it's a wee torch as well. <laughs> Which is like, that's what two companies do. Eh? When you yeah, go down to, totally. It's like, totally the type of thing that you get. Yeah. Yeah, that's quality. That should be really cool. Yeah. That's no, yeah. <laughs> one of my favorite favorite rewards of all Kickstarters. I have to say. People love your rewards like that. Like your um, your mats and your like your funky like random bits of stuff that like. Different comic creators managed to make out of their yeah. Well, the Kiltopia toothbrush is yeah. you know, is probably <laughs> the, the one best. <laughs> but even even if, if you've read Kiltopia, the fact that there's a Kiltopia toothbrush is totally illogical. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I hate to keep coming back to obviously it's the TV program at the moment. But I hate to come back to the boys, but it all fits into that kind of aspect that um. If there's money to be made, you know, not the running joke in Kiltopia again, it, it, or that prevalent sort of satirical vibe is that like if there's a if there's money to be made out of something, why not? So why would you not? If you know if Kiltopia is massive, why would you not have a Kiltopia toothbrush? <laughs> it totally it totally fits into the the sort of the the aspect of the world that exists in, which is funny because um, in my one of my uh, one of my goals. And my 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 Kickstarter that's running just now is beer mats, and the only justifiable reason that a beer mat has got anything to do with the comics, the podcast. But unless you tempt me, you would be like, like this is interesting, Jeff. Like this, but why have you got beer mats as a <laughs> why have you got beer mats as a as a as a as a pledge reward? The yes, yeah. for a comic set in a set. <laughs> Muslim country <laughs> in a place that doesn't. <laughs> Totally. And a place that is is known for being relatively like, alcohol free. Um mm-hmm. but I did mention that and I did mention that in the Kickstarter that you know it's 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 to prevent watermarks on tables, it's nothing to do with like actual <laughs> Yeah, it could be used with all manner of beverages. Yeah, of course. Um yes. non alcohol <laughs> totally. Oh dear. Yeah. Okay, um is that us? I that's us. Yeah. <laughs> That's plenty. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you for joining us. Okay, thanks. <laughs>
Yeah, we've got five likes. Um, there was lots of people dropping in and out tonight. Um, please drop any comments. Thank you for um, Craig for joining. No, oh, Jeff just gone. Oh, well, then I'm just going to say goodbye, folks, and uh, we'll see you next time. Don't know if we've got any guests lined up, but we'll, we'll find out. So we'll be back same time, same place next week uh, with some more beer and comics. So for the time being, cheers. Hi, internet's been funky as anything tonight. Sorry, guys. Um, thank you to um, Craig for joining us. Mr. Payton did um, a phenomenal, um, phenomenal interview with us earlier today that you should totally check out. Um, really, um, and you should check out all his uh, links as mentioned earlier. Um, and yeah, uh, at Craig Payton on Twitter, at Craig Payton illustrations on Instagram and. Yeah, it's Kickstarter's live. If you just search Craig Payton hard code, code not core, hard code, you'll be able to um, you'll be able to find out all about his um, recent Kickstarter, which is looking absolutely phenomenal. Uh, a tremendous artist. Thank you for calling for always for joining us. Thank you for everyone that got involved in the comments, particularly uh, Stephen Mackay. Thank you for stopping by. Um, please, if there's any questions or comments or that, just drop them in the, the link below, and we'll check you out at, uh, later. Um, Apologies for the drop out there. Apologies to Colin who hasn't come back to join us. Um, but we'll see you soon. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, thanks.